Good afternoon. Uh, we got a full update today, so we're going to jump right into the uh, uh, case update. Uh, today, the North Dakota Department of Health uh, confirmed 13 additional cases of the novel coronavirus disease or COVID-19, uh, five from Burley County, three from Stark County, two from Cass County, and one each from McIntosh, McHenry, and Ward counties. Uh, that uh, takes us from uh, 45 where we were yesterday with that 13, uh, our biggest increase yet uh, in daily positive counts to 58. Uh, 11 of those individuals are hospitalized. Uh, in context, uh, you know, how this fits in nationally, we're weeks behind where some other states are, uh, but the U.S. now has topping uh, 80,000 cases and over 1,000 deaths today. Uh, so we're still trailing uh, Spain and Italy in terms of number of deaths, but we're also behind them uh, in terms of the curve. Uh, being on the national uh, Governors Association call today, including uh, with President Trump and Vice President Pence uh, and other leaders. Uh, it's apparent that other governors uh, that are further into this are running into uh, very stressed situations for in terms of uh, medical uh, supplies and uh, hospital beds and particularly intensive care hospital beds uh, that have ventilators and appropriate staffing. Uh, so we continue to work uh, round the clock on a planning standpoint here in North Dakota, uh, taking all of this very seriously uh, as everybody in the state should be. Uh, as of noon today, uh, we still had uh, 1,390 collection kits at the Department of Health lab ready to send out uh, to uh, places that might be requesting them. We had the ability to run uh, here in the lab when those kits come back in. Uh, over 3,300 patient tests. So again, uh, we have right now the ability to do more testing than we have been doing uh, in uh, North Dakota, but we did have another good day with 306 uh, tests uh, coming in. That brings the North Dakota totals up to 2,261 people that have been uh, tested again with uh, 58 positive and 11 of those hospitalized. I, I, there was yesterday a brief discussion. Uh, we do report this by county. Uh, there have been uh, some folks, a lot of discussion on social media uh, saying, oh, that person's not in our county. Uh, we can only report this based on the addresses that people have when they, that they provide when they do their testing. Uh, but I should just remind people, it doesn't really matter uh, whether or not the, there's zero positives reported in a county or not, because uh, by the end of next week, it's likely to assume, we should just assume if you look at other places, the way the rate of spread is that we will have positive cases in every county in the state. We should just assume that that's where we're gonna be going. Uh, and, and so then the p rules that we have and the guidance that we provided do apply to everyone. Uh, and again, if you're someone who's uh, being tested or someone in your household is being tested, uh, you know, you you should make sure that you're uh, isolating if you're in contact with someone who's a presumed positive or a confirmed positive. If you're an older person or someone who's got underlying health conditions, uh, you should be trying to avoid contact with people as well. Uh, if you are have mild symptoms and you're not feeling well, this is the time uh, to be North Dakota smart versus North Dakota tough and to stay home. Uh, and again, whether you're feeling great, uh, if you're feeling great and you say, hey, I want to get out and about, uh, then keep your physical distance from other people. A recommendation is uh, six feet or if you're Canadian, uh, two meters. Uh, uh, avoid gatherings of more than 10 people. And of course, frequent hand washing is a great way uh, to do that. We've also had questions and I, we want to adopt uh, what other uh, states and provinces are doing, which is uh, when we've got returning residents, whether they're students that are returning uh, from spring break, uh, if they're coming back from an area that would be considered a hotspot, including Florida uh, or other places, if you are a uh, snowbird, as they're called, that may have been vacationing in Florida or Arizona or other places, California, that have a high degree of, of, of uh, positives being reported, then we would also encourage those individuals uh, to stay at home for 14 days after their arrival back in North Dakota. And I do know that there are many people that are doing this. We thank them uh, for doing that. And if you haven't been doing that, it's still time to start uh, to reduce your contact uh, with other folks. So that's the that's the update on, uh, on testing and guidance in terms of how we're trying to uh, manage uh, the key, slowing the spread uh, here in the state of North Dakota to give us a chance to make sure we continue to build up our, our capability in healthcare. 
Uh, another uh, notice, so sh switching to the next topic, uh, Real ID. Uh, some of you may uh, know or Hopefully everybody knew, but I don't know if we were getting the word out because only about 25% of North Dakotans out of 152,000, or it was about 152,000 or 25% of the residents uh, had completed the process to upgrade their driver's license to a real ID. Uh, that real ID was a federally mandated, uh, particularly related to Homeland Security and TSA. Without it, you were not going to be able to board a plane as of October 1, and we're grateful that the Department of Homeland Secu Security uh, today has extended uh, indefinitely the real ID deadline uh, and so the health and safety of North Dakotans are number one priority and uh, this is one step to, re to reduce that because again to get a real ID uh, did require an appointment uh, and a number of, of uh, a number of uh, Identif identifying documents to allow you to get that and get that upgraded. But so right now, if people have their real ID, that's fantastic. Uh, if you don't, uh, we'll continue to resume that process once we open up uh, physical appointments at our, our DMV uh, locations. Uh, <clears throat> next topic, child care. As we announced on Monday, uh, we were, uh, we've been uh, engaged in a uh, very uh, thorough uh, emergency planning process as a way to develop operating guidelines to ensure that uh, child care uh, is available for health care and other uh, lifeline workers during this COVID-19 crisis. And to drive home how important a piece of uh, social infrastructure child care is in our state, uh, 71 percent of all North Dakota children ages 0 to 5 have all parents uh, in the uh, the, their workforce and 78% of all children with ages 6 to 12 have all parents in the workforce and this reflects the strong work ethic in North Dakota and it reflects the high workforce participation uh, that we have and I think that you know all of us who are parents uh, know that our great, greatest concern as parents is about the, the health and safety of our children and during a time like this in particular and particularly parents that uh, are continuing to go to work uh, to do the important aspects of keeping our economy rolling and continuing to live uh, you know medical care law enforcement uh, and uh, p fire protection, all the things that, that our lifeline workers do, uh, that this is a deep concern. So we went into this planning process with earnest and number one objective of this planning process is to protect the health of our children, their families, and the child care workers that care for them. The second objective was to provide child care for health, safety, and other lifeline worker households. And the third one, which is very important uh, because we're facing both an economic crisis and a a healthcare crisis is to sustain sustain the childcare sector during this emergency and its recovery, uh, because the childcare uh, is essential to every business in North Dakota. Whether you're a small business, a medium business, a large business, in every sector, if you have team members working for you in North Dakota, there's a, a seven out of 10 chance or higher that someone in your organization that worked for you was able to work for you because somebody else was was helping to provide childcare uh, in a safe and healthy way during the day so those employees could be at work. So we need a fully functioning childcare system when this pandemic ends and when our economy gets back on, in, on track. And that's why there's an incredible amount of work that went into crafting uh, this guidance and this program. We got input from childcare providers uh, of all sizes from the smallest in the state uh, including people that deliver care in their homes up to the large centers uh, that we have in some of our larger metro areas uh, input from the Department of Human Services and their leadership the governor's office and other stakeholders and now I'll invite our Department of Human Services Executive Director Chris Jones uh, to give you the the overview of what's in the guidance that we're announcing today uh, that will take effect on Monday Chris Thank you, Governor. This initiative calls for doing three things. One, publishing modified operating practices for childcare facilities to increase safety during this epidemic. It also is providing emergency operation grants to childcare providers who are licensed in the state who continue to serve both emergency, who continue to serve both during the emergency and during the recovery and coordinating with existing child care providers and participating school districts to ensure adequate child care opportunities for K-5 children who are in health, safety, and other lifeline worker households. I'll now give a 10,000 foot view of each piece of the plan 
More detail is being posted online as we speak and will be shared with providers later this evening on a, on a conference call. First, the modified operating practices. We're encouraging all child care providers to remain open and serve children and families during this pandemic, but with additional precautions. Those precautions include a limit of 10 children per room that includes both adults and children, keeping staff with the same children as much as possible, and staggering and limiting the use of common areas. Providers should also limit the access to the facility as much as possible. We've provided a list of screening questions that must be asked each day by the staff, caregivers, and parents before their children can enter the facility. The plan also includes guidelines for meals and playtime designed to minimize interactions that could spread the virus as well as enhanced hygiene and safety practices. Now for the second component, the Child Care Emergency Operating Grant, which we are kindly calling the CIOG. This is meant to cover some of the extra operating costs that will come as a result of the modified operating practices, but also to help sustain the child care industry through this period of significant disruption. The emergency grants will be available to all child care providers licensed by the state. Those who accept the grants must agree to prioritize children of health, safety, and other lifeline worker households. They also must agree to put a cap of $50 on the fees they typically charge families to hold a spot during extend, extended absences during, between care. Under current projections, these emergency grants to providers could total around $11 million per month statewide with a timeline of nine weeks. Funding will come from the Department of Human Services, which licenses child care facilities and administers the child care assistance program that provides payment support to lower income families. Again, participation is not mandatory. If a provider decides to opt out of the emergency grant, they won't be required to prioritize lifeline workers or modify their absence policies and fees. However, they will be required to follow the modified operating guidelines. By now, you're probably asking who is a lifeline worker. These are the workers whose services are necessary in meeting basic human needs such as food, shelter, health care, and safety. This is by no means an exhaustive list, but examples of lifeline workers could include first responders, law enforcement, and emergency personnel, people who work supports who support access to food supply, agriculture, and distribution of other necessary supplies and equipment, health care and human service workers, including those who deliver care in facilities, in homes, and remotely. More examples will be posted with the plan on the DHS website. We recognize every community is different and every provider's capacity will be different. We encourage each provider to use their best judgment in prioritizing lifeline workers to meet their community's individual needs. We recognize that it's essential for health, safety, and other lifeline households to have access to childcare. Without it, our ability to meet basic health and safety needs during this crisis will be severely constrained, which puts us all at risk. As we talk about protecting our most vulnerable populations from COVID-19, our elderly and those with chronic health conditions, we can't lose focus on the future of our state, our children, and the impact that loss of employment and additional stress is in the home and having them. The third major component of this initiative is child care for kids in kindergarten through grade five who are in health, safety, or other lifeline worker households. Where there is a community in need of outside of the existing child care providers and where the community conditions allow, we're encouraging K-12 school districts to offer childcare on a temporary basis. They can accomplish this by utilizing ancillary school staff, such as paraprofessionals, and not credentialed teachers. These ancillary staff are already background checked and able to care for children of this age. To allow communities to do this where they deem it necessary and appropriate, the governor has amended the executive order signed last week that limited school access to essential staff only. Some districts are already planning to do this, including Bismarck Public Schools. So that's the child care initiative in a nutshell. 
Under our timeline, the modified operating practices will take effect on March 30th, and the first child care emergency operating grant payment will be made on April 10th. We know that parents, providers, school districts, and employers will have lots of questions about this. We appreciate those questions, and we will do our best to answer all of them, starting with our call with providers after this briefing. Details are available on the website for the Department of Human Services at www.nd.gov DHS. Click on the COVID-19 button. Details are in the provider resources area. Again, we have three goals here. First, to protect the health of children, families, and child care workers. Second, to provide child care for health, safety, and other lifeline worker households. And finally, help sustain the child care sector during the emergency and recovery because it's essential to every business in North Dakota. We absolutely must have a safe and fully functioning child care system now and when this pandemic ends and our economy gets back on track and we're confident that this plan can help us achieve that goal. I screwed it. Thank you, Chris, and uh, thank you to you and uh, Jessica Tomlinson and all the uh, leaders and all the private sector health care providers that have been involved in creating this plan. And uh, again, I look forward to uh, uh, you uh, talking with them in more detail on that statewide call tonight. Uh, next topic uh, we want to talk about is elections. Uh, with the coronavirus dominating the news in our daily lives, it's easy for other topics to fall by the wayside. Uh, but the one thing we would never uh, want to ignore is one of the things that's the foundation of our democracy, and that's the ability for every uh, legally aged legal resident to have the right to vote. Uh, the June 9th primary election in North Dakota uh, is only 76 days away. Uh, candidate filing for that is April 6th, uh, and we've got a plan in place to, to uh, keep moving ahead. Uh, and as we urge people right now, as in terms of practicing our safe distance, uh, to refrain from social gatherings of more than 10 people, uh, if those recommendations still happen to be in place in June, it would be difficult to comply with those recommendations the way we currently do polling, uh, particularly in many of our larger cities. So in collaboration uh, with our Secretary of State, Al Jager, Attorney General Wayne Stengem, uh, and with input from the North Dakota Association of Counties, North Dakota County Auditors Association, uh, you're about to hear an approach uh, that has been uh, agreed to that will allow every eligible North Dakotan to cast a ballot in June while protecting the health and safety of poll workers. Uh, and to execute on that plan today, uh, I signed an executive order. And of course, as all executive orders were attested to by the Secretary of State, uh, it's a team effort, uh, two signatures on each of those. Uh, and that waives the requirement, this, today's executive, waives the requirement that counties must provide at least one physical polling location on primary election day. What this does is it gives a uh, counties the local flexibility and the local control to conduct the June 2020 primary by a mail ballot only if the county chooses to do this. Right now we've got 33 counties that do mail-in ballots, but under current law, in addition to the mail-in ballots, they're required to have that one physical location. Uh, and we also know that in many uh, parts of the state, uh, the people that volunteer and serve and work at those polling locations uh, might uh, fit into the uh, age category of vulnerable adults that we're trying to protect. So again, we're, we're doing this with thinking about not only the voters, but the poll workers. Uh, we also had a call uh, today uh, with tribal leaders uh, earlier this afternoon uh, to let them know. We talked about a number of topics over an hour and 15 minutes with the tribal leaders in our state, but one of the topics was letting them know that we've added this flexibility to the counties uh, to give them, uh, to allow the counties to protect the health and well-being of voters and poll workers, and we're encouraging uh, those tribes to work with their county auditor to make sure, again, because our goal is to make sure that every eligible North Dakota and has a right to vote. Uh, today with us, uh, we've got our Secretary of State, Al Jager, uh, who's going to explain more about the changes. And I want to thank Secretary Jager for his forward-looking uh, work with he and his team uh, to help put a plan in place to make sure that we can have uh, safe and viable elections, uh, as we always have in North Dakota, but have them keep going even during this pandemic. Secretary Jager. 
Thank you, Governor. I also want to echo my uh, thanks uh, to you and your staff who have been credible in terms of working with the last uh, few days. Also to Attorney General Wayne Stengem because he's provided valuable legal counsel. And as you also mentioned, uh, was the, uh, our, our partners at the county level, the county auditors who uh, we work with on every election. And we received a lot of input from them. And um, then finally, I have to thank my deputy, uh, Jim Silverum, and my election team uh, because uh, they've really been working hard and putting in a lot of hours. The governor mentioned that uh, the election is only 75, 76 days from now, and uh, we can't be preparing on June 1st for anything. We have to do that now. Candidate filing deadline is 10 days from now. 29 days from now, we will have to provide, by state and federal law, ballots to military and overseas voters. And so uh, the election in June is happening already. We're, it's right upon us, and so uh, we need to uh, we need to start working on it. Um, every election is important, and one of my concerns over the years has been that the June election often is characterized as the primary election, and I always shudder a little bit about that because the. June election has many aspects to it. One is that it is a primary election for state offices, district offices like judicial and legislative, and for county positions. But it is the general election for cities in North Dakota. And it is the general election for many school districts in the state of North Dakota. So this is not a primary election for them. That is their election. Uh, the city commissions, the park boards, uh, school boards, government that's closest to the people, that's going to happen on June 9th. And so it's very important that uh, voters are, have that opportunity uh, to vote in every election, and particularly the, the June election. Now, what we're going to be doing uh, is the state will be mailing out absentee applications to every voter, every person that is listed in the central voter file that's maintained in our office. They will receive an uh, absentee voter application. And th then uh, it'll be, they choose to request a ballot uh, they fill out that application and mail it to the county. And the postage on that mailing will be covered. So they do not have to pay postage for sending in that application. And then to send in the application, uh, we have a very sophisticated uh, method of tracking when people have applied, when those uh, ballots are, are when those applications are received, when the ballots are sent out, when they're returned. The counties have been doing an excellent job on that, and we do have a system in, in, in place for that. That probably is the most important. As the governor indicated, we are encouraging the remaining count counties that do not currently have vote by mail to uh, adopt vote by mail. It is a county option. Uh, but it has to be approved by their county commission. And so we certainly hope that the other remaining 20 counties will avail themselves of that and take advantage of what we're able to do from the state and what, what their partners can, can do uh, with them. And so that's the main thing for the voters right now is that, yes, we won't have normal polling locations, but you will have that opportunity to cast your vote. Uh, this afternoon, uh, when we uh, complete uh, this conference, a message will be going out to all of the county auditors in the state detailing uh, the governor's executive order, uh, what's going to be done, what we're going to be doing, what counties are going to be doing. And so I'm very confident that everything is going to work out very well. Will it be challenging? Yes, it will be challenging. But, you know, our... Over the years, uh, I think North Dakota uh, uh, 
has experienced a very excellent record of conducting elections. There's no reason to believe that anything will be done any, any differently. Uh, our office, uh, my team, the counties, what they have in terms of their teams, uh, we've been very, very good about everything. Uh, it, it's, and as I've often uh, mentioned in the news and, and to our, our, our auditors and, and election people, our goal is that the day after the election, the news is all about the results and not about the process. We're going to learn a lot. We're going to be working very hard in conjunction with our counties to have another successful election in June. As to what's going to happen in November, well, that's not a decision that needs to be made today. But we're in the best position with our laws and what the governor has done with this executive order to make sure that elections in North Dakota will continue to be very well run. And I thank you, Governor, for this. Again, I thank our partners at the counties and everybody else that's been involved in making this uh, possible because the June election is right upon us. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary, for your foresight and for your diligence uh, in making sure that we can have uh, effective elections in June. Uh, next up on our agenda, a uh, lot of things going on, uh, both on the national level and state level in terms of new and nice, fun flexibility related to uh, when North Dakota taxpayers have to pay their taxes. So here to give us an update uh, what this means for our state is our state tax commissioner, Ryan Rauschenberger. Ryan, thanks for being with us today. Well, first of all, uh, thank you, Governor, and your team for your leadership during these difficult times. I'm going to keep this brief. Uh, last week, the U.S. Treasury announced that they were extending the income tax filing deadline to July 15th. This decision is intended to keep $300 billion of liquidity in the U.S. economy for the next 90 days. As a reminder, our office made the decision to follow suit and allow state income tax filers to wait to file their income tax return and pay until July 15th this year without any fear of penalty and interest. There's no need to contact our office to receive this benefit of waiver or extension. It is completely automatic. So you have until July 15th to file this year. Hopefully this will provide additional fiscal relief for the families and businesses struggling to make ends meet uh, through the next few months. In addition, we're working with businesses on, on a case-by-case -case basis to offer extensions for numerous other tax types that we administer to include, uh, but not limited to, sales tax, lodging taxes, uh, restaurant taxes, uh, just to name a few. Businesses simply need to contact our office to request those extensions. I advise taxpayers who are looking for answers to go first go to the COVID-19 response page that the state has set up, the central page. On that page, there's a link a tax link um, that will get you directly to our COVID-19 FAQ page. And then from there, it'll have all the con um, a lot of Q&A, and then it'll have the contact information at the bottom of the page where you can get directly to the people that you need to talk to in order to get your extension based on the tax type that you're um, interested in. And with that, Governor, I'll turn it back to you, and I'll stick around for any uh, Q&A at the end. Thanks, Ryan. I guess the headline, you know, some people say uh, 50 is the new 40. Uh, July 15th is the new April 15th. So that's uh, good stuff. But thanks for you and your team for all they're doing. And again, the website that Ryan was re referencing was uh, ndresponse.gov. Uh, uh, next topic is uh, census. Uh, there, uh, we've talked about there's opportunities for things to do when you're at home, uh, when you're either in 14 days of isolation or you are uh, taking time just to be with family. But one of those things we would encourage everybody to do to put on your checklist, if you haven't already done it, is a chance to participate uh, in the census. You may have received a, a mail invitation on Mar sometime between March 12th and March 20th. Uh, the census compared to this is the national federal required census that everyone is uh, invited to participate in. Uh, and it is, uh, 
been greatly enhanced since 2010. Um, so it's never been easier. You can now take the census by mail, by phone, and for the first time, because you couldn't do this in 2010, you can take the census online. Uh, and, and here's the best news of all. If you complete the census by mail, by phone, or online, no one will visit your house asking you why you haven't completed the questionnaire. Uh, and uh, this is a time when, of course, it's maybe never fun to have a, uh, somebody knocking on your door uh, but uh, that is coming from the government. Uh, but if you uh, have an opportunity to fill it in, no one's going to call on you. So you're going to save money, save time, and you're going to actually be doing your part to really help North Dakota. Why is that? Because when you respond to the census and we say that you count you individually count, Every, you, your family, every one of your family members counts, uh, how the federal government during normal times, and of course, even now during an emergency, you know, how are all these stimulus bills being discussed in Congress? A lot of them are being distributed by states in terms of formula. And that formula often is based on the number of people per state or per capita. And it, in the annual, in a typical operating year for the federal government, about 675 bills billion dollars uh, in federal funds on schools, hospital, roads, public works, and other vital programs are distributed on this per capita basis. And local governments use the census for public safety and emergency preparedness. And that includes everything from Medicaid, Medicare, SNAP, uh, women's, infants, and children, the WIC program for nutrition programs, community health centers, etc. What this means over a 10-year period for North Dakota is that every missed resident and we know in 2010, when the oil boom was happening, we missed a lot of people that were actually residing here, but that meant we lost $19,100 in federal funding over the last decade for every person we missed counting. So every person matters for public health, for education, and for infrastructure and more. And in a time when personal privacy matters more than ever, by federal law, the census data is kept completely separate from any other government agency. It's not accessible by the IRS or by any health groups or by any anybody else. It's safe, it's confidential, and it's secure. So you can help North Dakota, you can help your neighbors and help your community by going to mycensus2020.gov, taking this time while you're at home and filling out that sentence, census. Um, Next topic, uh, unemployment count. Uh, I'll just skip to the uh, punchline. Uh, you know, yesterday we reported uh, uh, 2,117 uh, new claims for unemployment today through 3 p.m., 1,127. Uh, that's a total of just under 14,000, specifically 13,968 in nine days, a record for North Dakota. We've been receiving a lot of questions about unemployment insurance and benefits. Everybody's situation is different. Uh, if you've got questions, we ask you, to, you that you go to jobs nd.com or call the unemployment insurance benefits automated phone system at 701-328-4995 and again uh, as mentioned again we want to encourage everyone to make sure they're getting accurate information and uh, the first place to go is ndresponse.gov it's got a bunch of links around uh, all kinds of things that would be helpful to citizens to help guide them through this, or specifically health.nd.gov takes you directly to our health department. Uh, that ends our briefing today and we'll open for questions. And I see that we've got uh, Chris Jones, uh, Secretary Jaeger, Tax Commissioner Rauschenberger, Lieutenant Governor Sanford, uh, and myself, and perhaps others here to answer questions as needed. Last point you made about the unemployment, just to because the stimulus or whatever you want to call it is going through. Have you looked at what they got for unemployment, unemployment insurance uh, in that bill, and is that going to be adequate for North Dakota? Uh, question from Radio Legend Dave Thompson leading us off again today. Uh, is uh, have, we, have we looked at what's in the federal bill that's going through, and will it be adequate for North Dakota? The uh, answers, we've looked at what passed the Senate last night. Uh, of course, there may be changes as it goes through the House. Uh, and, you know, there, people are optimistic that that bill may be signed by the weekend. But it appears that at least coming out of the Senate, there are substantial additional benefits uh, on, that would be provided federally on top of what uh, the North Dakota plan was already providing. And, and so we'll see if those pass through. But I, I think it's going to be... Uh, a 
th this is a this stimulus package that that is just like this pandemic is without president the um, without precedent the amount of stimulus that's being planned in terms of being injected into the economy is also without precedent and so i think that uh, the it, as that as we get into the weekend and people explore the details people who have been have had a job loss related uh, to this uh, may find that there are not one but multiple ways uh, that they could have their income restored. Uh, and I say multiple because the, the, there's some elements relative to the small business, uh, which is talking about in the Senate version, which is talking about loans to small businesses, which might cover their operating expenses for a period of time, a month or two, but only if they keep everybody employed on their team. And if they keep everybody employed and still have the same number of employees, uh, when we get through the, uh, if you will, the sort of the shutdown, then those loans could be forgiven. I mean, there's some really, uh, you know, generous elements that are in here that could help all sectors. But of course, that's all up in the air because none of it's been passed yet. Jacob from KFYR. Uh, Governor, with uh, in regard to the new child care or the daycare policies, uh, obviously there's going to be a rush to hire more people to look over the kids with the 10 person limit now. <clears throat> Is there a change to how uh, backgrounding these new individuals could uh, expedite the process? I'll start, and maybe uh, Chris can uh, come up here, uh, and, the, and I'll repeat the question. The question was, with the, uh, with the change uh, in ratios of providers to children, uh, Jacob was hypothesizing there might be a rush to hire new people, and if so, uh, what are we going to do about background checks? All of the rules relating to background checks uh, are everything still is still in place. None of that has been waived. We're trying to increase uh, the safety, not decrease the safety for our children. But uh, we have a lot of parents that are at home right now, uh, and so the and we've got the. Uh, slowdown in the oil industry. So we've actually seen a drop in demand for childcare uh, in the state. And some of the people are reporting a substantial drop in childcare. Uh, we believe that the needs that could be met uh, for the folks that are during this emergency, the, the qualifying for the emergency operation grants could be met with their existing staff. In fact, uh, that third component of providing the emergency operating grant uh, may actually inject dollars back into those child care providers so that they can keep their staff. So again, this is a this is part of what we're trying to do uh, because we know that three weeks ago, we had a shortage, just like we had a shortage of nurses, we had a shortage of people working in child care centers and it was hard to find them. The last thing we want to do is, uh, is have those providers who are working hard to provide that care lose their employee base. We'd like them to have them retain them. And with these uh, lower increased uh, ratios uh, of providers to students uh, will require more staff per student, but it may not require more staff in total because of the decline in the number of kids. Chris, anything you want to add to that? Yeah. You want to talk about uh, infant ratios and some of those other things? Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Governor. Yeah, a couple things to add. We, we did not change the ratios as it relates to zero to one and one to three. So those ratios remain the same. Ages. Ages, Ages yes. The age is zero to one and one to three. Um, and when we work with the, the different providers, the different groups, we feel that it's less about the ratios itself of staffing that's going to be the constraint. We believe that space is going to be more of a constraint. So we will actually be taking our licensors and our coaches and working with the child care providers across the state on how they can reconfigure so that you can have 10 children or nine children and one teacher or health care child care provider in a room. So we feel that there's more constraint that way than there actually is with, with the staffing. Do you have a rough estimate of how many child care providers are in North Dakota? Licensed child care providers? Uh, today, I'm going to start by saying this just so everyone's aware. Child care, we don't have a lot of great data. Um, and, and as we come out of this pandemic, it's important that we all work together to get the right data so we know exactly what's out there. Many of these other social service programs or healthcare, we know how many hospital beds, we know how many long-term care beds. We don't know really how many are out there because it's not as a sophisticated of an industry. So I wanna start by saying that, but then we're approximately say 15, 1600. As of today, um, 174 have closed and our capacity is down since the start of the pandemic by about 23%.
in terms of serving children. So this is, this is a fast moving in a, in some ways of, of a collapse. And if we don't do something soon, we're really putting our, not only our children at risk, but also our economy at risk. For the, uh, for the, the uh, soft-spoken and polite media, we may have the most polite media in the nation, uh, the two new microphones that we've added here today uh, allow me to not have to repeat or rephrase your question. So if you all just talk up a little bit louder, then uh, we can skip that part of the program. Yes. Tom Simon, Williston Trending Topics, Coyote Radio. We had a, one of our major hotels in Williston closed last night, the Grand Williston. They gave uh, absolutely no notice to 50 plus employees who are now out of a job today. I talked to Jenny, who's the uh, front desk manager this morning. She came from Portland two years ago and now she loves North Dakota, but she wants to know should she stay and she wants to know what you will do to help her stay. Uh, if everyone heard the question, we'll assume that about a hotel closure in Williston, but I would encourage anybody whose business is shut down to uh, uh, you know, contact jobsnd.gov uh, for unemployment insurance. Uh, and and this is a, in Williston, I mean, this is the, the, the double whammy that's occurring right now, which is we've got the uh, slowdown in the economy related to fighting the pandemic, and we've also got uh, low oil prices, which is really causing a slowdown in the oil industry, which of course will impact our communities there. So, uh, you know, we're optimistic about getting through uh, this health crisis. Uh, and when we get through that health crisis, then the economy comes back. There's certainly going to be a demand for energy. Uh, and we hope that between what the state of North Dakota does and what the uh, federal government is doing with this unprecedented amount of, of support uh, is that the economy can be back going again. Uh, but again, that's all, all uncertain. But we're for, you know, if Jenny's out there listening, we're excited to have people like her have moved to North Dakota. And uh, we hope that people that love North Dakota will stay in North Dakota because we've got a bright future here. Job in. Okay, all right. We got mixing up our governor.com. Jobs ND dot com. Jobs ND dot com. Maybe if you want to put that one back up again, too. Suggested contacting labor as well. Labor okay, <laughs> another another uh, good suggestion uh, coming in from Jody Hansen is that uh, for Jenny would also uh, contact the uh, North Dakota uh, Labor Commissioner as well if she's got questions about uh, employee rights. Uh, we could contact them and they've got their their own website or we could maybe let's put up a link uh, where we can get to the Labor Commissioner through the ndresponse.gov. Correct. In, the, in, the state? Uh, in light of the no notice uh, in terms of their closure to have message the state, uh, I don't. Uh, uh, private sector uh, leaders get to make their own decisions and people that are, you know, I mean, in any business that I know that's got, you know, strong leadership and uh, in a world where, where we're likely to return to having a shortage of team members is I would encourage any business member, any business owner to have strong proactive communication with their team members because uh, uh, when, they, when you, I understand the economic conditions why people might have to close, but if there's a day when you plan to reopen, uh, having strong relationships with those team members matter. So I would encourage everybody in the private sector to do uh, follow good business practice, which is uh, communicate strongly with your employees. But that's my advice as a former businessman, not as governor. Okay. Uh, Lane? Uh, with the Medicaid waiver that North Dakota received, does that push back any deadlines for filing? Question is from Lane is with the Medicaid waiver. I guess I don't have to repeat this. Does that does that change anything for North Dakota? I'm looking for a phone a friend on the Medicaid waiver. Chris is right here. You want to step up and take that one? Yeah. Could could you clarify the question? I just want to make sure I understand. Yeah, we had a viewer that has Medi Medicaid and he needs to re up his paperwork, but he's unable to uh, contact his caseworker right now. So he was just wondering if his deadline to re up is getting postponed. 
Um, I'd be happy to, if you give me his name, I'd be happy to follow up. But one of the things that came with the 1135, I believe, is we are not doing any redeterminations of eligibility for Medicaid through this time, if that's if that's his question. But if you can give me his, his name, we'd be happy to follow up and get him the accurate information. And, and Chris, I would just say the caseworkers we have are working from home. They're still working. Uh, but so there, there should still be a way to, to, uh, to make contact, but we'll make sure we follow up with this individual. Other questions? We've got one from online back here. Uh, April Baumgarten with the Foreign Embargo. Uh, unendorsed candidates and proposed measures will be collecting signatures. Uh, what's your message to those collecting signatures? And do you foresee COVID-19 hindering those campaigns, those signature campaigns? Could you hear that? Secretary, uh, Dan, you may have to shout that out a little louder, and uh, and then uh, I'll, it's for, it's an election campaign question related to g signature gathering. Unendorsed candidates and proposed measures will be collecting signatures. What's your message to those collecting signatures, and do you foresee COVID nineteen hindering those signature campaigns? Well, at this particular time, the law is very clear in terms of the deadline and the signature requirements. There's uh, no request. We don't uh, contemplate wanting to ask for one to reduce the number of signatures. Uh, we're, what we've been doing for the last uh, couple of weeks when we've uh, received this question, uh, what we've encouraged the people to do because this is an option available to them is to go online, fill out a candidate uh, petition form, complete it, and then take that, scan it, and send it to all of your friends. And those friends can get signatures, whether it's five or six in the house or the qualified electors or whatever, and then have those, uh, uh, those petitions come back uh, uh, to the candidate. The candidate can bundle them, and they can uh, submit them to the jurisdiction wherever the filing takes place. Uh, the statewide candidates are doing that right now. The ones, uh, you know, that there was a recent convention where the Republicans said that you need to be on the, go you know, through the primary process. Uh, that's what they're doing. Uh, le also applies to legislative candidates. Uh, on the city, uh, those, those get, get uh, filed with the city auditor. And again, they can do that. Uh, by fax, by scanning and, and, and sending uh, to that filing officer. Um, the thing is, is that by law, uh, signatures were being able to, they could have started obtaining them in January. And so there's a lot of people that have met those requirements already. And to uh, all of a sudden say, oh, now somebody doesn't have to get any signatures. We can't just reduce the number. Uh, either the law is completely suspended or uh, the governor doesn't have the authority to change the law. So we don't want the law changed at this particular point because the ramifications of, of opening it up uh, would be too great. Uh, we believe that the people that are really interested in running for office, they can use their ingenuity, they can use the electronics, they can do it, and uh, they have 10 days yet to get it done. And uh, so it's been... Uh, uh, People are, are resorting to that, and that's the way they're coming in. In fact, statewide and district candidates now file uh, on an online wizard with our office, and that's how we receive the petitions from them, is they download them, and we take them in and, and uh, print them and, and review them. Do state health officials have any opinion on whether petition collectors should halt their efforts, or um, can they safely collect signatures during this time? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the... Is, are there any recommendations for those people who might be collecting signatures in person to ensure their safety? Well, um, I think there's a number of different things they can, they can do. Uh, they can probably put the petition down and walk six feet away and, and have them sign. I mean, I... You know, obviously, there's a lot of recommendations out there right now in terms of how you, you interact with people. And uh, so I think that uh, I would suggest that they follow all of the criteria that I've heard the governor talk about for the last uh, several weeks in terms of, of how you do it. And I, I think that there's a way that they can, they can do it. And uh, uh, 
I don't know that there's any particular directive from any health official, but there's been directive in terms of how you interact with people, and I think there's a way of doing it. And again, they can do it, and it can, can be transmitted in a number of different ways back, and it can be done electronically. Any field with the Bismarck Tribune? Does isolation discontinued mean the patient is recovered? Can we actually accurately call those cases recovered? Yes or no question. So on the Department of Health website, it says that there's been nine cases of isolation discontinued. Can we accurately call those, like, you know, the patient has recovered? I think you wanted yes or no answer, so the answer is yes. <laughs> Jacob? Uh, earlier today, North Dakota Supreme Court brought a halt to uh, uh, eviction uh, claims, wondering if your office has considered bringing a halt or calling for a halt to uh, late fees or any other policies regarding rent with it being due on Wednesday. Uh, all of those are under uh, consideration. Uh, and as it relates to uh, North Dakota finance, uh, where we've got things related to HUD, you know, federal housing, uh, that all got discussed on our Monday North Dakota Industrial Commission meeting. Maybe that got buried, but uh, the, anything related to uh, North Dakota housing finance, uh, I think there's about 3,000 rental units that, that were allowed in, in involved in financing. There's a number of mortgages. Uh, we could give you a contact there, Jacob, to follow up, but all of those are following the HUD rules, which is no evictions and all of the all those rules. But we'll continue to try to get that information packaged and clarified, but we're on, we're on that one. Lane? Has North Dakota looked into getting that uh, drug that um, hydroxychloroquine, I believe is how you say it. Has, has North Dakota looked into that at all? Uh, we, we are aware that uh, at least one hospital uh, has done, is doing some trials of what was a, a malaria drug, uh, and it's been tested malaria drug without uh, what is also called a ZPAC as the name for uh, zithromycin. And they, those two things together seem to have some therapeutic benefit. It's not a, um, not a cure, uh, but it may reduce the amount of time that a person, say, that's critically ill may have to be on a ventilator, which would free up equipment. So there's a lot of interest in that. There are studies coming out of France that's got a lot of attention. And, and with the uh, uh, speed up of FDA approvals and other things, that therapy is, uh, you know, I think being tried in a number of places. We know at least one that's doing it here. And there was an effort as part of our task force to try to do an inventory of how much of that drug existed here. But uh, I, my guess without seeing the results uh, is that there probably wasn't a lot of malaria drug uh, in North Dakota. I mean, just because we're not a, a malaria-rich area, but I'm, that's a pure speculation on my part uh, that we, uh, you know, we, we, might have, we might have a lot of Z-Packs around because that's a very common uh, antibiotic that's prescribed for a lot of things. But uh, the, I'm sure the folks that are manufacturing that drug are ramping it up right now because of the interest in it. We'll go Tom and then to the back. So this is on Hub City funding. We talked uh, earlier in the week about uh, how it relates to cities. My question is how it relates to schools. Uh, District 1 in Williston has five to six million dollars in its budget directly tied to the income from Hub City funding. Should they start looking to other sources or is that five to six million that they've been getting protected? Brent, you want to take that one? Sure. That is, that's earlier in the progression of how the oil taxes are distributed. It's not down in the progression with Prairie Dog funding, so that one shouldn't be as much concern. But we will be looking at the budget as we go forward. It is not one of the final buckets for, for the Hub City funding. So hopefully that answers the question. And, and by, by buckets, uh, which is a term we use here, as revenue comes in, uh, there's an order in which those get filled. 
and which ones get filled first. And as Brent was saying, uh, the one that you're referring to, Tom, gets filled. Prairie Dog is, the, I think, the very last one on the list. And, and at low oil prices, then the Prairie, Prairie Dog, which was a bill that was passed last session uh, to provide funding uh, at the end of this, it was at the very end of the biennium, if those buckets were filled, then checks were going to go out. Uh, if we have low oil prices, then there's a risk that that, that there may be no money in the uh, the the prairie dog uh, which is the uh, you know local infrastructure uh, funding buckets it's not actually a bucket of prairie dogs we had some confusion about that statewide earlier but we're let's clear that up okay uh, what is the exact threshold of hospitalizations we need to have in north dakota before you give more detail about cases like age range and location uh we are continuing to provide uh, age, rage, and county, and gender, and we'll continue to report that. One more coming in online, and then. Eric Art with KZZY in Devil's Lake. Uh, has the state considered delaying the April 1st start of the non-resident fishing season to, uh, in efforts to limit travel? Uh, just to make sure everybody heard that one uh, from Eric Arnes from Devil's Lake, which is uh, one of the great fisheries in America there at Devil's Lake. Are we considering uh, changing the date of the non-resident fishing season to reduce travel in from other areas? That's one uh, we've not thought about, but we'll add that to our, our list uh, of things to discuss with the health department and with Game of Fish. So thanks, Eric, for raising that one. Lane, last one. Uh, have you had any policies that you've tried to enact but you haven't been able to or have been advised not to? None that I can think of. So we're we got it. We're 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 we're, 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 we're uh, I think have had good success in getting things through that we're looking we're looking at. But thank you, uh, Tom. Uh, we're going to call it quits for this one because we're uh, had committed to get within an hour. But uh, Mike, myself, others will be available uh, here afterwards uh, if we stay appropriate distance apart. But again, uh, thanks everybody for tuning in. Uh, and again, want to say to uh, grateful for all the people out there that are helping us navigate through this, and grateful for all the the parents that are doing. Uh, at home, all the school districts and leaders, there's so much work happening. I mean, you think about it, it's amazing that we're going to go from uh, teaching almost 100% on premise to to trying to do a deliver edu quality education for 113,000 students. Uh, and do that in a way with alternative and distance learning plans and get that done in less than two weeks. It's a, you got to marvel at the, uh, the capability and ingenuity of, of the state of North Dakota. So thanks everybody. Uh, keep charging. And uh, again, remember, you know, headline today, record number of cases, uh, really want to make sure that if you're, uh, concerned about your own symptoms, if you know somebody, if you're part of those 300 and 85 pending tests uh, that were taken in the eastern part of the state. If you're one of those or you're close to someone who's got a pending test, we really, really, really strongly ask that you're self-quarantining until you get your results uh, because the way we contain the spread, we're, we can still be in containment where other states are actively fighting a medical battle. Well, the longer we can do containment, the longer we can flatten that curve out, then the more time we have to prepare to make sure that we can save lives. So thanks everybody for doing their part on uh, keeping physical distance and and uh, practicing all the good practices. Thank you. Bye.